Stephen have enough credits? He's done it. Welcome to the uh, IPFS Bifrost Gateway as a service productized. Let's run IPFS really well for lots of users. Regularly weekly call. Um, on the agenda today, we have uh, QC OKR check in. Uh, we don't need to spend too much time on that. Let me just share my screen. Desktop two. Can we see a thing? What have we got? We've got M Burns. Can you do some OKR Q3 estimates? Zeros is fine. It's just we just need the need the reporting. Looks like everyone. sure. I can pull that up. Yeah, everything is done. Um, it would be nice to spend a little bit more time going through this and making sure that we're focusing on the most important things. But I think we should do that with Adrian and Hector present. So I'm not going to spend any more of this call time on that. Uh, but I would like to talk to Michael Burns about the EWR nodes. Gee, what what's going on? Michael Burns. Gotta find that mute button. <laughs> um, so I don't know what like the root cause um, of that problem was. Uh, yeah, I don't know if this was like weird GC or performance issues just bubbling up and EWR happened to be um, like it just happened to be its bad day, and so we had extra what, issues. What was the? What did we see that was wrong with it? Like it just? You said you was like uh, it's in a sorry state. Uh, yeah. So let's see what all had happened. Uh, originally, it was uh, this space filled up, um, and not clear why that didn't alert more loudly at us. Uh, but Bank One and EWR. Um, was just like unresponsive. So couldn't get into SSH, SSH yesterday, couldn't um, kind of recover via the console. Um, so not, not sure what went amiss there, went awry there, but um, it was sad. Um, mm -hmm. Easily solved by rebuilding it. Um, so destroy it and rebuild it in Terraform, mm -hmm. um, which revealed that uh, we are mid-migration, which is... <laughs> Um, kind of the worst place in the world to be. Uh, so Terraform has a different view of uh, the world in the config than Nginx, mm -hmm. uh, or than uh, Ansible. And so when building Nginx, it writes an invalid config file. That config file fails when you try and restart the daemon. That causes user data fail. That causes Terraform to fail. Um, and like the, the box is just in a sad state until you go massage it and, and get some things over. Um, can we? So that's easily, yeah, think, easily done by hand. But trying to get those out of sync, trying to remove all the logic from Terraform so that Nginx is just handled by Ansible, and there's not like a split brain situation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, strongly agree that we are not in the best position right now. It um, it is surprising to me that the Terraforms can't be run right now. Is that? Um, my, my understanding is can't be run. Uh, you said the, ter the terraforms run, but there's an error from the user data script, which means terraforms fail. Correct. So it's yeah. um, it is not able to deploy the certs that the nginx config file mentions, and so yeah. you can't restart the service. Um, so we partly migrated off of it. We just left terraform in a sad state. Should not have let it be there. And it would be nice if we could wire up a nightly to catch that a little earlier. Um, but I'm midway fixing and should be have a the PR for that up within the hour. I got to okay. just deleting stuff from Terraform, basically. Nice. Um, and then the process would be run Terraform, then run Ansible's and happiness. Precisely. Cool. And that might still be a two-step process for a little bit, yep. but eventually Terraform will fire. Off Ansible. Yep. Great. That's progress. Um, da, 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 da. In the meantime, the EWR node is still not reporting. One of the two. There, there's also no traffic being routed to it because yeah. Bird never gets installed because user data fails. So it's just harmless. It's just we have limited capacity in that region. 
Um, so, uh, so I will go poke at it. Um, I believe net data was streaming in last night when I, uh, called uncle. Um, <laughs> but yeah, there is at least a missing monitoring alert there as well to have, um, Marcus, you mentioned this, and I didn't dig into what that code actually looked like, but Filecoin handles this as part of its uh, user data script, which seems like yeah. a dope way to do it. Yeah, so anytime uh, the user data fails for any reason, there's a the trap um, in the bash script that will then uh, fire off a alert to the Prometheus alert manager. So anytime a node doesn't come online, you get notified at least. So we don't have that. We would be able to at least detect that a node failed to deploy. That's super handy. Um, and mm -hmm. presumably I can just go copy some bash and um, wire that up. Precisely, yeah. Okay. Um, so, all of EWR is on Michael Burns' plate. Is that okay, Michael Burns? Yep, I can get those up in short order. Okay, that seems like a high priority because we're seeing alerts, uh, memory use, like 5% of RAM available on the one remaining machine. And it's a pretty busy machine. Gotcha, I will type even faster. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not my objective. Or that this should be the priority. Um, Agreed. Okay, uh, bu -bu -bu -bu. so then the thing that has happened recently is we have now pinned all of the IPFS hosted sites to all the gateways except for the EWR ones, which as discussed, hasn't, hasn't been possible yet. Um, but this hasn't been the magic bullet to fix all our, um, uh, the sporadic slowness of certain sites getting accessed, although I'm interested to keep watching it. It should definitely improve it, but the things that are now impacting it are having a more proactive node failover strategy for gateway nodes. So I think this morning uh, AMS1 was being slow and Alan Shaw was reporting that he couldn't load file, uh, he couldn't load IPFS.io, which seems like the next most important problem to solve if we want to actually get some decent response times and reliability from these nodes. Um, I've raised an issue for it, uh, but I was wondering if you guys had any, had any thoughts about it. To, to make sure that my assessment is correct, we're, we're relying on BIRD, BTP, and DNS to do a kind of passive failover when a machine completely dies, like the BIRD it, the bird thing, the bird demon has to fail for the thing to be taken out and then there's still a kind of latency of a few minutes for the DNS update to stop routing traffic, is that correct? Yep. Yeah. Um, I suggest it would be potentially a priority to uh, do a little bit of redesign as in have uh, the Nginx and bird daemon coupled on one machine um, and then I think I think several, several people have uh, suggested then having the the nodes um, upstream of those so that we um, can at least have like some sort of back end um, checks and failovers. Uh, so I think right now, yeah, the idea that Bird is our only health check is a big flaw and probably contributes to a lot of our issues. Cool. Totally agree. I will raise one historical note. Um, before we rebuilt the gateways on packet a um, little less than a year ago, uh, we had the model of one front end box running um, Bird and Nginx, and then a back end box that did IPFS. Um, and from that discussion, we wanted to move to uh, Open Resty uh, so that we could have proper. Uh, active health checks um, because we were having the failure mode where IPFS would wedge but Nginx would not be aware of it and so would keep like 
sending traffic on to a dead box. <laughs> um, easily fixed. We kind of re-architected to solve that problem and obviously uncovered other problems. Um, mm -hmm. But having proper health checks that can handle like backends and failovers like that um, needs to be part of the the fix, I guess. Um, at this point, what would a proper health check look like? Um, my, um, my, my suggestion was like an IPFS get request for the empty directory seems pretty light. I want, Stephen, is that a reasonable health check at this point? Do we have anything more satisfactory or is that a good one? Uh, sorry, I was talking to the signals. What is it? Uh, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, we're talking about useful health checks that an IPFS daemon is in a functional state. So, so the Nginx can stop routing traffic to a stuck IPFS process. Uh, add a file on a different machine, try to fetch the file on the, the yeah. IPFS node. And see if it so works. I was, was going to say, try and get the empty directory. No, it'll always return the empty directory. It's like, uh, is that, well, is that a special case? Uh, it depends what you're trying to check. Uh, if you're just trying to check to see, like, is the IPFS redeem responding? Yeah, that's probably fine. You can probably also just like fetch version or something like that. Although that won't go to the block store. Actually, I think both won't. <laughs> that's it's like hard to force to like, go to the block store because you have caching everywhere. Uh, okay. My thinking is like actually just like forced to go through bit swap occasionally. Yep. Uh, and like so just add the time on one machine, fetch the time on the other machine. That's yeah. the thing. Um, yep. If you actually really want to like, or sorry, if you just want to test it, like, is this thing responding? Um, we need a thing at the level of like nginx can make a request or open resty or something can hit an http endpoint and say yeah the uh, thing says it's responding so yeah, so you can like, curl oh no one second let's see the perks no that's it. So yeah you can curl uh, slash api slash v0 slash version yeah yeah that is and, that that won't tell us much other than like okay the demon process is responding. Is, yes, the demon process is responding, but that sort of depends on what you want. Um, the if you want if the block store is responding, <laughs> that from the level uh, of we want know. the get get requests for data to so this is on a gateway node. It's fronted by nginx. It's high traffic, and we keep seeing uh, IPFS demons getting kind of ultimately frozen up or unresponsive. Maybe that they but, are responsive, but, but they're getting clear. So, yeah, like, so we, like, we don't have the answer to that yet. Okay. It isn't like frozen up not serving data that they have, or frozen up just not serving things. Period. Exactly. We don't we don't have that level of granularity. Right okay. Now. Uh, then I'm assuming it's frozen up not serving things they have, mm -hmm. uh, locally cached, which means that yeah, the, the solution is you like you find another machine, you add a file of that machine, try to fetch it on the on the first machine. Like, that's yeah, the only yeah. way to tell like, if they're actually piping data through. Mm -hmm. uh, otherwise, like. There's not that much, like, so, I'm sorry. We don't really even have any many locks. Okay, so there is one potential problem here. Maybe you find out a file descriptor somewhere, or uh, Nginx refuses to open more than a certain number of connections, like that. It's like, mm -hmm. if you have a machine that literally is not responding to version, then that's a big issue. Yep. Uh, uh, but I, I don't know how Nginx handles that kind of stuff. Uh, yeah. And that's something I just tend to do. We see a machine that's locked up, test version. Just yep. fetch a random uh, and the empty directory, and then like see what actually happens. Okay. That um, as a first approximation will work. Um, I think we're going going to get into sadness with um, hitting nodes that GC, and so like the daemon is responding, but they're not serving up any useful data, and so yeah. Uh, and the step forward, I don't think that's a perfect solution. But maybe I'm. Can you restate your concern? So a GC is, because um, it, it'll keep responding to requests. Uh, do, does GCing freeze the world, Stephen? Uh, GCing does freeze the world. Uh, so I can't do a get request while GC is in progress. Sort of. So, G, sorry, GC freezes the, does it freeze that? I don't think it, no, it does not freeze gets, it only freezes is puts. Okay. But this may block bit swap from writing to the data store, I think. Yep. 
So like, it means like you already have the data, I think you'll return it. If you don't have it, I think you won't. Okay. Yeah. Um, All right, well maybe this will work. I have we a good question this up. about garbage collection too. But, yeah. Mark Sorry, just um, garbage, garbage collection. Is there any benefit of running it on more frequent basis so that it's doing less, so that it yes. completes faster and uses less resources? If you, yes, if you run it more frequently, it'll complete faster. Uh, you can also just not run it. So another way of doing this is you literally just uh, delete everything and recreate the repo um, or snapshot and restore from snapshot. Um, that should just magically work in most cases. Um, yeah. That was something that I wondered about for sure. If we can just do some garbage collection tuning, it seems like it doesn't run that frequently. And then when it does run, it just can potentially freeze up the box. We, we had a, a out of memory error on AMS, mm -hmm. I think. So it could be due to, to that kind of thing, right? If they're, if yeah. the, you see Q gets too too large or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not a GC. GC is crap. Uh, the way GC works is it uh, walks the entire data store, uh, which means the more data you have, the more data has to walk. Uh, so, like the. Yeah. Although in this case, this is a funky case because it's literally a case where like we don't have anything. Actually, is there anything pinned on these gateways or not? So there is now. Okay, so that will make GC slightly slower because it actually has to walk that data first and then walk the data store and figure out what's not in that data. Yep. Um, but just in general, like literally deleting the directory would be faster. Um, yep. So, yeah. uh, so the, the, thing that's, any. Mm -hmm. the thing that's changed on the gateways recently is because we're seeing slow, um, slow response times for content that is on cluster, even though we're trying to maintain connections to cluster, we're regularly seeing s s just slow response times. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have deliberately pinned all of the pre PL websites and the Filecoin preprograms oh, okay. to okay. the gateways, which, and in total, okay. that's about 20 gigabytes of content, including dist.ipfs.io, which is the lion's share of the I space. See. Yeah, so that will make GC take a bit longer, because like, uh, cur um, basically current GC, so if you, let's see, how does this work again? Uh, one second, I want to check. Something. We can um, we can we can pause this for off, like there's an issue that we can we can go through this, but yeah, it'd yeah, be good. So yeah, it's, it's definitely an area to revisit. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So like, what GC does basically is it reads in all data that's pinned. Like it actually reads all the data off the disk, has to traverse it, and we don't mm -hmm. cache anything. Like like we don't cache the links and stuff like that. Um, then. Once it's done that, it walks through everything in the data store, but it doesn't actually read everything and deletes everything that's not like within the set of things that's already read. So it just reads the set of things to keep, then reads in the set of things as it has. If it's not the set of things to keep, it deletes it. Uh, so like, if you have a few things to keep, it's going to be much faster to actually read in all the data. Uh, but the second you start pinning a lot of things, GSGC will slow down. Uh, if you have anyone on your team that has bandwidth and experience with uh, garbage collection and files like this, <laughs> a lot of people in our safe situation are complaining about this um, yeah. issue because you, GC is you, not scalable. But. Are you telling us that your team does not have bandwidth for this? No. It's also, it doesn't matter that much for a lot of the work that package. Well, first of all, like there's no my team. Uh, yep. Really, basically not. Uh, there okay. is a uh, package manager team, and then yep. there's your team. And yep. package, like, this does not really fall under package managers because okay. package managers need to be able to add and retrieve files quickly, they don't really need to GC that much. Like it's somewhat important, but like actually a lot of actors want to keep old packages. Um, like, like running IPFS infrastructure, people do care about like GC and all these like higher, like I don't know, bigger system issues. Yep. Uh, okay. I see. Uh, from uh, the point of view of the gateway endeavor, like with a P whatever, P0, P1 endeavor, so I uh, might have to pull rank on that at some point, but because we, we don't have bandwidth. <laughs> it's super bandwidth constrained right now. Um, okay. No, it's just like, it's stuff like this, like if you ask the IPFS team to make stuff like this, the IPFS team is gonna say, well. Uh, yep, yeah, yeah, you know, like, understood. Actually, sorry, I, uh, back with this one, like there really is none. It's like there's, uh, let's, let me look at the actual roster. Um, it's, I think it's 
Alan, me, and maybe Aiden is technically on the team. Okay. Uh, That's okay. We can. We will have to hobble along with the GC as it exists now. We will. We will. We will try and raise it up the list of priorities, and uh, it's mm -hmm. kind of on Adrian at best if he has time to look at it. Um, Hector is very limited and is going part time uh, soon. Anywho, okay, let's put a pin in that. So the, the the outcomes of that are because we are now pinning things on the gateway, GC is now costing us more in terms of mm -hmm. RAM, RAM and CPU time when it does a GC. So we may trigger GCS, GC more proactively so that it's operating mm -hmm. rather on a full repo. But um, wouldn't we just wouldn't we just shrink down the uh, high watermark, like the max storage value? Rather than like proactively triggering it, just give it a smaller max. That'll help a bit. I don't think that'll help too much. Like, so yes, it'll make it go faster. But if you're pinning twenty gigabytes, that means it has to read twenty gigabytes off the disk and deserialize twenty gigabytes of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it will actually have to deserialize it to like understand it so it can follow links. Um, that's probably where the large portion of the time is going. The rest of it is just like walking through the league stuff. It's not that bad. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, we actually, are you using Badger or are you using FlatFS? I think we're using Flat. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, like, a large portion of the time is probably reading the 20 gigabytes of pin stuff. Uh, how long does it take usually? Uh, I haven't got that number at my fingertips. Okay. okay. Um, I can dig into that. Um, I'll open an issue for it and maybe we can just thrash out what are the best strategy for us in the short term and then longer term is. I think the, the simplest strategy is just like uh, snapshot the repo when it's in a good state, uh, then delete everything. So like if you have BGFS or any snapshotting or just copy things if you have enough space on disk, yeah. um, then that will make things a lot faster. It's um, a good point. Yeah, thanks for that tip, honestly. I, I think that that could definitely be a line to, to pursue for sure. Okay. Seems relatively low impact. Okay, mm -hmm. that's probably enough on GC, but it is definitely an issue. Yeah. Um, yeah. Da, da, da. Uh, so there was general support for redesigning our gateway node failover strategy, but Mr. Burns added the point that we've done this once already, so we should learn from the mistakes of history. Uh, so I guess it'd be useful, Mr. Burns, if you could add that note to the issue. Um, it's I on the bike, sure. the, the Bifrost repo, um, but maybe I guess focus on the EWR nodes first. Um, someone has added Filecoin proof params and IP get download update to this list. Mr. Strong. That would be me. Okay, so this, this is some interesting context, I think, for the Gateway team. So, um, was it last week? It was while I was on holiday at any rate. Uh, the Filecoin team. I uh, was having problems downloading proof parameters um, from the gateway. They were seeing uh, the download, uh, it would start, but then it would kind of taper off to like, you know, zero bytes being transferred. Um, people would cancel. So they were getting frustrated. So they decided to try using IPGET. So they would be able to um, to to download the proof parameters without involving the gateway. Mm -hmm. And um, what was interesting about that, um, those that got it working, there were some problems, but those that got it working still had major problems with downloading the proof parameters. So. Um, some people reported, you know, a 1.5 gigabyte file would take two and a half hours mm -hmm. uh, or, or more, and they would see the same behavior of um, the download tapering off and then starting again. So um, this is a little bit of anecdotal slash evidence that there's uh, potentially some of the issues that we've been facing on the gateway are not unique to the gateway and are more global to the IPFS network. So uh, just some context for some of the things that we've been seeing um, 
aren't necessarily remedied by using uh, a direct connection or by bypassing the gateway. Yep. So I think my understanding of this is that there there were some we've got patches into the gateway nodes and we have DHT boosters, but correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but we sort of, we know that there are still performance issues with the DHT generally. Yes. Yeah. So we, we know, we know for sure that like we are not out of the woods vis-a-vis. -vis You're not even DHT. close. No, we're like, not even close. So we've yeah. <laughs> made it slightly less terrible. Um, yep. but yep. like, uh, at the moment, well, sorry, we're close in that we have a lot of fixes that we think will help. Um, we're not close in that, like, we are still now working on the test infrastructure to, like, yep. analyze these fixes and determine what they do and if they work and all that kind of stuff. Yep. Yeah, exactly that. Like, we we have identified there's a problem, but then our, we've gone we've gone big solution to it. And so the fixes are now at the mercy of the testing procedure yeah. and, the, and the new release plan. Um, the release plan is out. That's not the issue. Yeah, the, the, the release plan is the release plan is great. I mean, like sticking to it. <laughs> yeah, enacting the release plan. Um, Sweet. Okay, we have no minutes left. Does anyone have anything else they want to talk about? Um, I just wanted to say that um, my main uh, area of interest um, from the uh, from Hector's planning document seems to be around service levels and, and indicators. And I just want to point out that uh, I'm still quite blocked on making any pro progress on that because we still don't have a lot of great metrics that are coming in. So like uh, one blocker is definitely the ES exporter thing. So I just want to make sure that that's still a, a prioritized thing because uh, I, I would like to be able to have a, a success rate for the gateway, but currently that's that's impossible with the, the metadata we have attached to our um, net data metrics. Uh, okay. Remind me why it's impossible with the current data? Because there's there's only the only metadata or like labels that are that are associated with the status codes is um, actually there, there there's barely any. So like you get a you you can see that we had like say for example a 499 code but there's no other information that is relevant to it so we don't have like what the uh request path is refer uh like any of that sort of stuff so we have four 499s are a big potential um source of like people are having problems uh but because it could be anything we have no way of trying to make a uh, sense of what those 499s mean without some more relevant uh, labels attached to it. So um, ES exporter would um, export all the fields that we currently see in uh, our, our logs in uh, ES or in uh, Kibana, which would give us a lot more options to like de deduplicate and make sense of the 499s, which is critical for our um, success rate um, indicator. Thank you. Um, it's still important, but nobody is looking at it right now. Um, uh, Adrian, George Adrian. was assigned that, right? But I'm not sure if he still is. Okay. How long, how much more have we got of George? Is he, is he offboarding in um, September? October. October, okay. Uh, so it's critical for our SLOs, which are critical for our incident reporting. Exactly, and as I say, that that also blocks incident or or, or being able to uh, declare an incident. I made a comment on that on that yep. reporting issue, um, and I think it's yeah, it's true. We we only have black box metrics still, and that's like extremely scary. Um, yep. So we want to have some indicators that are actually pointing to some you know precise data that that, that we have. Okay, that's cool. Um, a quick question for Stephen. So the gateways are currently running a fun job to reconnect to cluster nodes every minute. I'm just wondering if the is there is that a good idea? It, there shouldn't, any, break anything. it shouldn't break anything. It, so if you're already connected to that node, it's That's basically a, it's a no op. But it does it so it passes on. through the it passes through a wait when you do a call to connect. It passes through this kind of score. It's got this like fixed hard coded one hundred 
score yeah. that it passes through to the connection manager. Um, what I'm not clear about is what happens inside the connection manager with that score. Does it then reset the score back to 100 if it? No, it adds it. So, so uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, it, so these scores are assigned to tags. So yep. that has a unique tag. So it yep. resets that User tag connect. to 100. Yep. That tag is only ever set to 100 or zero. Yep. Yep. Or it's set to 100 or not set, so it doesn't really matter. I gotcha. So just continually set, because the tag is user connect and the value is 100. And if I keep calling that, it's always 100 and it can never be anything other than 100. Yes. Fair enough. OK, good to know. Um, all right, we're out of time. We're four minutes over. If anyone has any questions, you can say them now, but it's time's up. All right, there's so much more to talk about. These meetings are too short. But 30 minutes keeps us prompt. See you later. Bye.